Welcome to Southgate. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I just want to make sure that uh, if you are joining in with us today, that you are connected with a local church. Uh, we hope and we pray that if you're in the North Grenville area, that you are connected to Southgate in a physical way, that you are coming out to services and you are joining in on the events that are happening in person. And if you're wondering how you can get connected to some of those things, uh, we would just say that you could sign up for the email uh, that uh, goes out weekly as well. You can follow us on our socials and uh, check in on the website to see what is going on in person and in our community. And so uh, we want you to be connected in that way. And uh, if you want to participate in what we are doing by giving financially, that will be up on the screen. We hope and we pray that this service is a benefit to you and your walk with Jesus. Let's just do a little uh, poll here before we get started. Uh, who this morning is a little bit groggy because of the, uh, the, the rain? Anybody in here? Is everybody awake here? Seems like we're, we're, we're a little bit sleepy this morning. Ne next thing is hands up if you were here on Wednesday night. All right. If you weren't here on Wednesday night, you missed out. That was a great, uh, great testimony from Brother Yoon, and uh, amazing to have uh, this, you know, this place packed out, people driving from all over to, uh, to hear his testimony, and uh, just powerful, powerful testimony about his time in China and uh, how God brought him, brought him through that. And then finally, how many people, this will be a real test of what you're getting into here, Tim, uh, how many people have heard of Galcom International? Hands up. All right, not too bad, not too bad. I'm going to introduce Tim Whitehead. Come on up here. And uh, he's going to be sharing a little bit with us about one of our ministry pa uh, partners here at the church, Galcom. And uh, I, don't want to, I don't want to say too much about Galcom because I think you are going to do that. A little bit. Yeah, a little bit. But uh, I think last time we had um, Galcom here was Alan. And that was, do you guys remember when that was? It was a long time ago. Uh, it was a long time ago. So we need to be educated. We need to be brought up to speed on, uh, on everything Galcom here. So let's give a warm welcome to Tim. Thank you, Pastor. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, it is an, an honor to be with you, to be part of your mission's focus over this last month. Um, stayed overnight with uh, Oscar Maria Zollinger, and they were telling me about all the different speakers and what's been going on. And I have to confess, I was a little intimidated. I'm just an accountant from the wrong side of the tracks in Hamilton. Um, I don't kind of compare to Brother Yoon and some of the other speakers. But then I remembered, I've got the word of the all-powerful, all-knowing, sovereign Lord of the universe that I'm going to share this morning. So whew, it's not up to me. So great. Um, so turn in your Bibles to Psalm 37, if you would. And while you do that, I do want to share a little bit about what Galcom does, and more importantly, why. For, so for those of you that didn't put up your hand, uh, that don't know what we do. First of all, we build radio stations all over the world. We've built radio stations in places from Albania to Zambia, uh, from Greenland, or actually Oscar helped us put a couple stations in, all the way down to Micronesia, if anyone knows where Micronesia is. Equipping pastors, equipping missionaries to reach a larger area, to reach a larger audience. And then we make these. Okay, you talked about Alan. Okay, so you might, he might have done something like this. He pulled the radio out of his pocket and said, uh, this is a solar-powered, fixed-tuned radio and audio Bible. And we manufacture them in our little office in Hamilton, and we send them all over the world, about a million and a half now to about 130 different countries. 
uh, partnering with hundreds of different pastors and missionaries and different mission agencies so they can reach more people with the gospel. And you might say, Tim, radio stations and radios, isn't that kind of old fashioned? Come on, like, get up to speed here. Well, let me tell you what. You agree with it? Yeah, you were, question, you were wondering that. Sorry, I should have let you just ask. Uh, why then do we use radio, radio stations, radios to preach the gospel? Well, there's four issues uh, that radio solves, four barriers that radio overcomes. The first is literacy. Who here knows how to read? Don't be embarrassed. 70% of the world doesn't. Okay, so if you give them a printed scripture, they may use that to start their cooking fire. Or worse, they'll use it as a lucky charm or a talisman in their house, thinking that because they have a Bible, they have some sort of magic charm. We need to engage the scripture. So we need to be able to present the gospel in a way that most people will be able to engage with it. And that's audio, radio and audio Bibles. I forgot to mention already, I'm not five minutes in, I'm already forgetting to mention things. Our newest radio includes an, an audio Bible. We have partnerships with Wycliffe and Bible societies. We have hundreds of different Bibles that we can put in here, different languages, um, sermons, messages, teaching programs that we can put on there in the mother tongue of someone so they can understand God's word for them. So it overcomes literacy barriers. Second, infrastructure. You probably woke up this morning, turned on your light switch, went to the bathroom, flushed your toilet. More than half the world cannot do that. So when you start to say, um, why don't you use digital, social media, why aren't you doing podcasting and all that kind of stuff? because most of the world is still living in a grass hut or in a place, oh, sorry, we need to go to the next couple slides here, sorry. I should, I forgot to quote yank my ears. So there's our literacy. Uh, We're working in areas where there's very low literacy. All right, next one, infrastructure. There we are. This is the kind of areas we're working in. This is in the Andes of Peru. This is a Quechua village. They don't have running water. They don't have electricity. They don't have home computers. They may have a cell phone, but they don't have a data plan. Radio, specifically solar radios, are free. You can listen all day and never have to pay anything. Who who pays too much for their data plan? So they don't have to stream anything. They don't have to have electricity. Uh, The radio stations we build are low powered and and we can run them off solar panels and reach 50, 100 kilometer radius. So this is the efficiency of radio. It beats that infrastructure barrier. Uh, Next one is geopolitical barriers. Anybody here been to North Korea? Exactly. Oh, one. Okay. Well, that's the first time that's ever happened. Um, Missionaries, you can't go into certain places. You can't go in and say, hi, I'm a Christian. Let me tell you about my Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. But you can't stop radio at a border. You can't put up a wall big enough to stop a radio signal. Uh, You can't, well, this guy we're going to talk a little bit about later. You can get into the jungles in violent area, difficult zones. You can get up into the Andes, out into the islands. Radio covers areas where people can't get to. And then finally, the last barrier is the workforce barrier. And this is where we're going to talk a little bit more today. There are only, there's less than half as many missionaries from the global north, Canada, U.S., Western Europe, going overseas, serving cross-culturally in missions as there was just a generation or two ago. People simply are not obeying Christ's command to go into all the world and make disciples. Radio then allows one person with the right tools to reach a massive area in the world of darkness. Um, the familiar verse where Jesus says to the disciples, look at the harvest, it's plentiful, but the workers are few. Pray the word of the harvest. Well, back when Jesus said that, harvesting was the whole community going on in the wild land, cutting down, running, and threshing it. Any farmers here? There's got to be one or two that pass about the farms. Do you still have cut your tree and things by hand? No! He used a tractor, a combine, a harvesting worker, he used tools to be more efficient. Radio is incredibly efficient, it's very cheap. One person at a station can reach tens of thousands of people. And they handle the radios in the community, they leave this behind in the next community, they multiply themselves. So that is why we use radio. Uh, there's some statistics out there about finances. The church in North America gives less than 2% of its giving towards reaching unreached peoples. 3,000 people, 3,000 unique language and cultures have never heard the name of Jesus Christ. But the study, uh, Gordon Conwell Seminary in Boston, they said they found that Americans spend more money on Halloween costumes for their pets than the church does on reaching the lost. That's an American study. Of course, maybe we do a that. So let's talk then. I want to challenge you this morning about joining this workforce somehow, somewhere. Um, 
There's a very pastor by the name of John Piper. I like him a lot. He's had friends with me. He talks about missions. He has a great quote. He says, Missions exist because worship doesn't. Worship is the ultimate, not missions, because God is ultimate, not man. When this stage is over and the countless millions of the redeemed fall on their faces before the throne of God, missions will be no more. We won't need it in heaven. We won't need to be going around telling people. Because we're all meeting there worshiping the Lord as He should be worshiped. But right now, we need missions. We need to tell people about Jesus Christ, His death on the cross, His it's, it's saving work for us, the forgiveness of sin that's available, the reconciliation to God through Jesus Christ. We spent some time worshiping this morning. We sang. Um, but I want to propose that worship is more than just what we did. We're going to read this Psalm 37 here, just the first nine verses. As you know, Psalms is the worship manual, the ancient hymnal of Israel. And there's a lot of Psalms that lift up their hands, lift up their voice, shout to the Lord, sing to the Lord. This Psalm says nothing about what we've just done this morning in our worship service. So let me read it, and we're going to explore what it means to worship God in a little bit of a different way. Psalm 37, verse 1. Do not fret because of evil doers, nor the envious of the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord, do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord. He shall give you the desires of your heart. To make your way to the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness and your life and your justice as you need it. Rest in the Lord. Wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Cease from him. Forsake wrath. Do not fret, it only causes harm. The evil who are shall be cut off. For those who do not the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. Father, as we look at your word this morning, I pray that you would speak to us through your Holy Spirit, transforming our minds, softening our hearts. Help us to hear from you and to be motivated to serve you better, to go to a deeper discipleship relationship with you. To give our lives to you fully. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. There are four commands in this short passage of scripture about how we are to worship God. Uh, four imperatives, four words there. Uh, the first is in verse three. It's the first word it is trust. Thank you. Thank you for participating. You're all welcome to, to, to participate. Trust. Trust in the Lord. That's a bit of an abstract uh, idea. What does it mean to trust somebody? Well, sometimes it's good to define a word about what it's not. There's a great verse, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. You know, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. I think I'm going to have a different version of the Bible that we're just quoting it. Lean not on your understanding. So trusting in God means not trusting in yourself, in your own intellect, your own strength, your own abilities, your own goodness, um, skills, education, and so on. So let me tell you a little story from our history of Yellow um, to explain how this trusting in God works. If you want to go, oh, there is a You mentioned Alan Pearl. Alan was one of our founders at Yellow Room, and the uh, ministry was founded in 1989. And uh, maybe just to put radios, that's how we started. Just making those solar radios tuned to other ministries, radio stations. And then people started saying, We love these radios, but we don't have a station in our area. Can you build one of these? And this happened back in 1992. A gentleman from Portia, Albania. Albania was the world's first official media station. Uh, their president, the Bible Cold War era, said, There's no God. Albania needs no God. And that was it. Closed all the churches. You couldn't say, There's no people to cough if someone sees. That's God bless you, Albania. And so, 1989, Berlin Wall falls, communism falls, and why the initiatives come to Albania? And this man, Chief Malak, comes to faith in Christ. After a lifetime of atheism, hopelessness, doesn't know what's going to happen when he dies, he hears the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, and forgive his sins and give him eternal life. And he says, he immediately accepts Christ, and he wants to tell everybody in his city about Jesus, about this hope that he's found. And he thought, if I started knocking on doors, it's going to take me years to tell everybody about this wonderful good news about Jesus. How can I tell everybody all at once? The answer? Radio. We're going to 
still, I know in Sunday school, the answer is always Jesus, today it's always going to be radio. Radio. So he goes to the government and says, I don't have permission to go to the Christian University in my city. They never done this before. They went, yes, he is teaching. Now let me go and set up a Christian station. And then he goes, I don't have money, I don't know how to go to the station. So he goes to the conference in the US, and by sheer providence of God, he tells me to go to the It says, hey, What are you doing? I'm looking for something to help with the radio station. Now it says, That's what I do. So we get all the information out, comes back to Canada, visits a couple churches. It says, well, we have an opportunity for a Christian radio station, a former media's primary station, with your help, and within the days, we raised thirty thousand dollars. This was huge for us back then. Uh, fast forward, they get all the equipment purchased, they're ready to go, they got the plane tickets purchased, they're about a week away from the trip, and now gets a phone call from one of their missionaries. He said, I don't know, you're going to a radio station in Albania. How does he say, it's amazing. God has worked miracles. They've got a license in Albania, we've got the money, we've got the equipment, but they got land. You can just see God's hand all over this. And the guy says, Yeah, well, I'm not going to tell you something. Uh, we're a medical machine. We just try to get over there and do some work. And we got to the, to the airport and went to customs. Um, you know, the, the communists aren't in charge anymore, but you know who it is? The mafia. So they just confiscated all of our stuff. Alan, it's a fool's errand. Don't go. At best, they're going to tax you, import tax 100%. At worst, they're just going to confiscate the equipment. Alan said, Well, thank you for your advice. And, and, um, and he'd stop, now what do I do? And this is what it means to trust in God. Now, I'm not trusting God's plan, but if you are in and follow God's revealed will in his written word, go into all the world, the gospel, okay, we know that we're doing what God wants us to do, is that what God tells us to do? And we can see God's hand of provision, he provided the license, the land, the money, the equipment, everything was all set up to go. Now we have to say, God, we have to trust you to finish the job, or am I going to rely on my abilities to do it? And quite frankly, we have no influence in the Albanian government or the law, we can't get this stuff in on our own strength. So do you give up? Or do you say, God, I trust you? Alan decided to trust God. He and the engineer got on the airplane, they gave all the equipment, they flew over, and Alan said, No, on the flight over, he started to go to the So the devil started churching in his ear. Oh, Alan, we're full. You're going to have to go back to Canada for tail between your legs and apologize because all the equipment's going to get confiscated. You're going to ruin your reputation. The ministry's going to fall. And this is what the devil does. It's you. And he says, Lord, I'm going to trust you to help through this. They get there, they land the airplane, they're getting all the equipment together, our boxes and skids and, and our carts, and they're going to the customs desk and they're just waving for you. Take the passport stamp and wave for you. Don't ask a question. Don't ask a box. Don't ask anything. On the other hand, Pastor Chi is waiting for Brother Alan, Brother Alan, you wouldn't believe this. And Alan go all of the customs officials, all the workers at the airport, went on a strike for higher wages. There's only a couple of officials left in the world, how to handle all the people, just waiting through. You see, when we trust in ourselves, we've only got our own strength and ability to do When we trust in God, we've got the sovereign part of the universe. Who can do everything? Worshiping God means trusting in Next verse, verse 4 is commandment. What do we do in our relationship with God? Delight, thank you. Delight in the Lord. There's a promise here. Delight yourself in the Lord and give you the desires of his heart. Uh, this is what's sustaining. We saw a picture of him earlier in the airplane. He grew up in Columbia as a missionary kid. He actually is a seven, eight year old in service just like this. He heard a missionary. And, and he says, God, I want to be a missionary. And he started praying that his dad was quitting his job and going to the mission field. God answered his prayer. They, so he grew up in Columbia, his parents were Bible translators. But at the age of 20, Russell was taken captive by the FARC, the atheist, militant, communist, rebel fighters. 150 days, beating, tortured, dragged through the jungle until his family paid a $50,000 ransom to get him free. The guy who freed me said, Russell, you never mentioned the council of post traumatic stress. He said, Don't worry about me. He said, I knew I was captive for 150 days, but those guys that belong to this communist group, the FARC, the FARQ, they're more happy than I am. They've been brainwashed by this communist atheist ideology. If they wouldn't leave, their families would be at risk of being executed. We need to reach out to them to free them mentally, spiritually, free them from the bondage of their sin. That was his delight. You see, the world has all things to offer for us. Uh, we can delight in things in the world. The Bible tells us, warns us that the things in this world are passing away. You can delight it. And all sorts of pleasures and activities and goods and your house and your fancy car. And you can delight in the world or you can delight in God and what God wants. 
Russ chose to delay in the Lord, to, to make him his priority. Russell started at home, and so I almost got ahead of myself here. So how does Russell then reach out with the gospel to all these guys hiding in the jungle that would probably shoot something on sight if you didn't? Well, the answer is? Man, good. That was even more enthusiastic than the first thing. So he sets up a radio station. If you want to make it this, it covers the entire nation. And he goes, how am I going to make sure people are listening to us? Well, then he found out about God. God will radio. So you'll see all my own presentation here, but I got a radio with a little parachute. He was dropping radios into the jungle with little mini parachutes so that he could get access to this. Because he would do it at night time where night vision comes and shoot at his plane and hear his plane going by to get there under attack and also he start hearing this gospel message and music. They go and they find this little radio in the field and hear the good news of Jesus Christ. Fast forward 20 years, five years ago, Columbia and Broker Peace, they invited us to be a special mediator at the Peace Talks. The promise. If you delight yourself in the Lord and give you the desires of his heart, Russell just wanted people in Columbia to come to Christ. He just wanted peace in the country to his adopted nation. God answered that prayer. He gave him the desires of his heart because he delighted in God. He didn't go back to the U.S. and, and live the American dream. He delighted in the Lord. Worshiping God means trusting the Lord, delighting in the Lord. Verse 5, there's another one there. Commit. Let me read it again. Commit your way to the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness and the light and your justice as the new day. I think the NIV says, you'll bring your, you'll make your righteous acts shine like the new day sun. These are our founders. We mentioned Alan Burrow, he's the guy on the old right. Uh, he's from Billings British. Uh, as a young man, he was very successful in marketing, and came entire off of him his own store. He had a baby. And then God actually, because Alan was about to go down, God actually made him go. Uh, he was semi paralyzed for some time. His pastor came to visit him in the hospital. He thought the pastor was going to come and say nice words about him and to him and pray for him. He said, Alan, when are you going to stop messing around with God? He's called you into ministry. The man in the middle there, Ken Crowell, was a Motorola engineer down in California. God called him into ministry to Israel. Be a missionary in Israel. So now, what can I do to be a missionary in Israel? Well, he was attending. Is this his mission? He set up a factory there to do cell phone antennas. Because that's what he knew what to do. Hire Jews, hire Arabs. They got Bible study in the morning. Eventually, they planted a church, Peniel Fellowship. It's still there. If you want to go to Tiberius, Israel, you can go visit Peniel Fellowship. Wonderful church, wonderful spirit, uh, doing all sorts of great work. He gave up his engineering career to go over and do missions. A man on the left, Harold Kent, is our founder from Tampa, Florida. Kent Family Feeds, one of the largest feed companies in America. Um, God challenged him to get involved. See, back in the mid-80s, the three largest radio ministries in the world, Transworld Radio, Fires Broadcast, and HCJB, had this plan to cover the whole world with Christian radio. And uh, each of these three men heard this presentation. Harold on the left said, what a dumb idea. Who owns a shortwave radio that receives a signal? And God said to him, Harold, you have the money. You provide the radios. Ken said, that's, that's intriguing. Um, I don't know how I can help. God said, Ken, you have a factory. You can make the radios. And Alan was working for another ministry called the Recordings when he heard this, and he knew where he was working at the time in northern Kenya. There was a radio broadcast in the area, and he looked around at the grass huts, no infrastructure, no electricity, or anything like that. And he thought, these people will never hear the broadcast in their language. And God said, Alan, Alan, you make them the radios. And by again, sheer providence of God, he brought those three men together to form Galpha. But what does that have to do with commit? A lot of people ask what our name means at Galcom. Well, the common symbol, communications. Gal is the Hebrew word for commit. Also means to roll over onto. So if you've got a heavy bird, you've got a donkey, and they got this big bird on the donkey, you can't lift it off, it's too tall. So you tell the donkey to kneel down and to gilt on it. It rolls over it, dumps the load off. The picture is if you've got a burden that's too heavy for you to bear, you can't stand up on it. You, you roll it off and you dump it up, and it says here, you make your way to the Lord. You take that burden and give it to God, and you say, God, I can't carry this. It's too much for me. But it says, commit your way, not just your problems. Uh, whenever you see commit your way, commit your walk, or when the Bible talks about your way or your walk, that's code for your life. Are you willing to commit your life to, to take all of your dreams and ambitions, all of your wealth, finances, and influence, and say, God, I'm going to roll it over to you and give it to you to use. That's the 
Trinity said, I walked into it, God. These three men walking away from doing life your way, living a dream, comfort, finances, good health and family, and say, God, I'm going to commit my life, my skills, my abilities, my resources to you. And there's another promise. He'll bring forth your righteousness into the light. Or as I said, it's like what your actions are, the things you do, will be like the noonday sun. If these guys had just lived their lives, they would, no one would know who they are. But instead, they've spent a million and a half years around the world. There's about 10 million people hearing the gospel because they've committed their lives to the world. Worshiping God isn't just singing to Him on Sunday morning, thanking Him for who He is, but it's committing our lives. That is an act of worship. Committing our lives to Him. The last one there, verse 7. And you're already doing it. Rest. <laughs> Rest in the Lord. I've been telling you stories that happened quite a, long, a while ago at Galcom. This one's my story. Uh, I mentioned that I'm an accountant. Uh, it's, it's a story on its own. I lined it up here in the radio industry in Michigan. Um, you saw the statistics around the screen about literacy. South Sudan has the third lowest literacy in the world, and actually do more work in that country than anywhere else. It also has the highest rural living population. There's one major city due by the capital. Everybody else lives in grass huts spread out all over the place. Like that grass hut behind my friend there. Rape is absolutely the answer to get the gospel to associate. And it's a vital area too, so it's not safe to be traveling around. So radio from one spot, a safe spot, broadcasting. And so we're working with a number of ministries there. The largest is called Every Village. The ministry out of Houston, Texas. We've done about 160,000, 170,000 radios. Back before COVID, um, they were doing about a thousand meetings a month. And then I got a call in March from their director and said, Tim, one of our board members is an oil executive, a big guy out of Houston, Texas, a big oil executive. He went over to Celsius and saw the need and said, I'm going to give $100,000 and, and you guys got to spend more radios. And I should explain the radios cost us uh, $20 to make. When we add the audio buying portion, it costs us another ten dollars, so thirty. That's U.S. twenty U.S. or thirty U.S. If it's a radio only, a radio plus audio buying. But because the ministries we work with are often doing a lot of other things, they're running clinics or schools or pastor training, or in this case, they do water balance. Um, we subsidize the cost fifty percent. So if someone orders ten thousand radios from us, they'll pay us ten dollars each, hundred thousand. We have to raise that money. So we were already committed to 10,000 radios for this curve here with them, and they wanted another 10,000 more. So um, Peter calls me up and says, Tim, can you do another 10,000 radios for us? And I know the need so soon. I know what radios the answer. And so I said, yes, I stepped up in faith. I trust the Lord. Yes, we're going to do it. We're going to match those funds. We're going to raise the extra money. Praise God. We pray about it. We committed it to the Lord. And then I started to think after I hung up the phone, oh, no. We don't have that kind of money. We've already got commitments to other people. And as an accountant, I did the math. And I'm thinking, I'm going to pay our ministry this week. What am I doing? Oh no. Um, called down to our accountant, and I said, hey, can you uh, run some numbers for me? How much money do you got to pay? Can you do this? Or what are we committed to? What's our budget for the rest of the year? I started to fret. Verse 7. The rest of the world, wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who crosses through his way. Cease from anger, for shape wrath. Do not fret, it only causes harm. I started to worry and fret. Now, I know this passage. I trust in the Lord. I delay in Him. I'm working for a vocation as a mission. I've committed my life to Him. But I couldn't rest in Him. I started pulling all of the worry back and trying to do it myself. Now, there's a verse in 1 Corinthians that says, God will not let us be tested above what we are able, but will with the temptation always make a way to escape that we may be able to bear it? So if you're in a bad situation right now and you're worried, God, I can't get out, don't worry, he won't give you something that he will not either give you the grace for or an escape from. Well, God knew my limit. And as I'm sitting there at my desk, fretting about this, I was supposed to be preparing for a sermon for a little church down in Niagara Falls. And um, whenever, whatever I'm preaching on, I always like to come to Psalm 37.5 because that explains the name of Galcom, to make your way to the Lord. So Galcom. 
But my eye, the Holy Spirit, kept bringing my eyes down to verse 7. Rest in the Lord, wait patiently for him. Rest in the Lord, wait patiently for him. And I saw the verse, and I took my Bible, and I pushed it away from me and grabbed the spreadsheet and started fretting again. And I think God said, okay, he's not getting it. The phone rang. It was a gentleman from Alberta said, Tim, love what you're doing. Uh, following the ministry for years, we just sold our family farm. Uh, is there a need that you have that we can give to? And I said, well, actually, uh, I uh, need $100,000 for radios for South Sudan. It says, check is in the mail. If I had just rested in God and waited, I would have saved myself all sorts of heartache and ulcers and over the week or so that I was fretting. You see, we can trust in God because he is the sovereign Lord of the universe. If we delight in him and, and rearrange our priorities, and delight in him and not in the things of the world, he'll give us the desires of our heart. When we commit our way to him, when we take this, all of our dreams and hopes and ambitions, our problems, our fears, and we commit them to him, roll them over to him, he can carry them. He's able and faithful and allows us to rest in him. Worshiping God is a lifestyle of trusting and serving him and following his lead and waiting on him. Why do I say all that? I could have just told you more about Galcom and try to convince you to support Galcom, but no, there's a bigger need. I mentioned that we have a workforce problem in missions. Uh, that John Piper quote, you know, missions exist because worship doesn't. I think the opposite is also true. Missions often doesn't exist where worship does. We come here and it's very nice, comfy chairs, better than the, I go to a hundred plus year old church. We still got the wooden pews. This is a nice place. The, the worship time, the singing was wonderful. And we worship God and we think we're done. No. Worship isn't just what we do here when we sing. It's what we do in our life outside of this building. Acts 1.8 when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. We are all called, if you are a Christian, if you have received God's promised Holy Spirit to empower you, if you have confessed your sins and accept Jesus Christ's death on the cross as the substitute for your punishment for your sin, if you have put your faith in the person and the work of Jesus Christ, you are now to be a witness of that to others. Here, in the region, to the next region, Quebec, that's there are Samaria, the ends of the earth. We're all called to be witnesses. A lot of people say, though, I'm not qualified. I can't get up here and preach like Pastor Ben. I, I can't do music. I don't, have, I don't fit. Um, our testimony at Galcom is a whole group of people saying, I don't know what to do. I met a guy that worked for Time Warner as a technician. He was at a missions conference. He goes, I don't even know why I'm here. I said, what do you do? He says, I'm a technician. I work with Time Warner. I said, like running cable? He said, yeah. Climbing towers? He said, yeah. I said, you're here to meet me. Now he's gone to Guinea-Bissau and Belize and, and Zambia and Tanzania, Albania. Uh, I'm missing a couple more. Anyways, you get the point. He's using his skills and abilities. He's committed his life and skills and abilities to serving God. And because he's delighted in God, now there are hundreds of thousands of people hearing the good news of Jesus Christ because this man simply said, I'll serve the way I'm able. The point is, you are all qualified, absolutely qualified to be missionaries. I, I glossed over Alan's story about being paralyzed in a hospital. I hope that never happens to somebody where God has called you specifically to do something and, and you're like Jonah running away. Don't do that. If God has, has even put a little whisper into your ear saying, hey, talk to the waitress at the restaurant. Talk to your neighbor. Tell them your story. A witness isn't a qualified person. If you see a car accident, you don't have to be a mechanic to say what went wrong with the car or a doctor to say what happened to the person. You just have to say to the police officer, blue car hit red car. Witness. All you have to do is say, what did Jesus Christ do in my life? He healed me. He took away my sin. He took away my shame. I now have a hope for heaven and eternity. I have peace. That's all you have to do is tell what Jesus did and be a witness. Um, Hebrew words have many meanings. So I'll finish with this. It means to commit. Uh, that image of that donkey rolling over means to roll over. But it also means a wave. The Sea of Galilee, very shallow. All you, we know all the Sunday school stories of Jesus calming the storms of the Sea of Galilee. Radio travels by waves. 
sound travels by waves. So we have a little slogan, I think it's up here, make waves. But also in the colloquial, we, we talk about if you're making waves, you're disturbing things, you're making an impact. It's like a stone in a pond and you start to ripple. The challenge for us is to make some waves where we are with the skills and abilities and influence that we have to be a witness for Jesus Christ. There are so few people saying yes to serving. There are so few people saying yes to giving to missions. You've heard from people much more eloquent with greater stories than I have over the last months who are simply witnessing for Christ that need us to come alongside and support and help. Again, 1 Corinthians talks about a body. You can't have the whole body being an eye. There needs to be a hand and a foot and so on. We all need to do our part as the body of Christ to do the work of the church, which is missions. Not just worship, but missions. So I'd say let's make missions part of our worship. Let me pray for us. Father, I just thank you so much for the chance to share from your word, uh, the chance to fellowship with brothers and sisters in Christ. And Lord, as we, over these last several weeks, the, the congregation here at Southgate has been celebrating missions, celebrating people going around the world and telling people of Christ. And I pray that it wouldn't end with that. It wouldn't end with, wow, that's incredible what they are doing. Lord, I pray that it would end with a challenge to our own hearts saying, now, Lord, what do I do? What is my part now in serving you, in witnessing for you, in committing my life to you, trusting in you, delighting in you, and then, Lord, resting in you and allowing you to do that? Lord, I pray the blessing of this congregation has committed themselves to talking about missions over this last month, and I'm going to empower them to use them to be witnesses for you, to spread the gospel around the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Please come back on the table. I have a prayer coming where I would love for you to be praying for the ministry. I got a little gift so you can take anything off the table, but the way you do it, those. There's pants and little pants and things like that. I'd love to chat with you more about maybe where you fit. Maybe you're the next guy like Bob who's chatting around the world to the radio stations. Anyone? Come see me. Thank you so much. God bless you. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much, Tim. Just as we close out together, I'll get you to stand.